All right, kids, you're released. The rest of us, let's open our Bibles, please, this morning to Romans chapter 3. If you're visiting with us the first time this morning, we go verse by verse through a book of the Bible on Sunday mornings. Wednesday nights, we go chapter by chapter. And uh, this, this morning, we're currently in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 3 and 4 this morning. Let's go ahead and read that, and then we'll pray. Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Let's pray. Lord, we lift ourselves up to you once again this morning as we open up your word. Lord, would you open up our hearts? Lord, would you soften them? Would you tenderize them, Lord? Uh, just by the, the working of your Holy Spirit that we might be alive uh, to your word, your living word, Lord. Would you anoint us, Lord, to hear, to change, to come alive maybe for some even here this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's look back at verse 1 to kind of get a little better context of what Paul is writing about here. Uh, if you look at verse 1, it says, you know, what advantage then um, has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God? Now, when we met a couple weeks ago, and we looked at, you know, what the, those scriptures meant. Um, but Paul the Apostle, again, is writing to the church in Rome. He has told the believers, you know, that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also for the Greek. That's Romans 1.16. He also went on in chapters 1 and chapters 2, basically denoting how everyone needs the gospel, Jew and Greek, or Gentile, if you will. And as we come into chapter 3, though, because Paul had just finished kind of, you know, pointing out, hey, you can't just trust in the fact that you're a Jew. You can't just trust in the fact that you've been circumcised. We need to be circumcised of the heart. And so he basically c continues into chapter 3. Well, what profit then is it in being a Jew? And he says, well, much in every way, for to them have been delivered the oracles of God. And now he continues this morning, he says, For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? So as he continues on this same thought, Paul is basically explaining that even though the people of Israel had received the very oracles of God, the very words of God, in what we call the Old Testament today, what we call even the New Testament today, that there were many Jews who did not believe the word, the words that God had given them. They did not live in obedience to them, because, and in thus doing so, they displayed that they really did not believe them. And so it's interesting, even here within our text, where it says, you know, that, you know, for what if some did not believe? So we obviously know that many Jews did not believe. The Greek wording there literally means, you know, what if it means they were being unfaithful? So what if many of them were unfaithful? You see, these are those who we read in verse 2 had been entrusted with the oracles of God, yet many of them were not faithful to those words of God that they had been given in trust by God. And as we read through the Old Testament and on into the New, we cannot help but see that the Jewish people, for the most part, were unfaithful to the words that God had given them. Read through the book of Isaiah. Read through the book of Joel. Read through Ezekiel. And you'll see over and over. Read through Nehemiah. It doesn't matter where you go, sadly. We are, as human beings, rebels at heart. 
We are at hum- as human beings sinners at heart. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, the Jewish people not only received the oracles, the words of God, they were also, for the most part, unfaithful to the words that God had given them. You know, again, a side note, it's another reason I've always found it very odd that even today, so many people who profess Christ seek to embrace more and more Jewishness in their Christianity. And yet you go back and you look at what the Jewishness was, and in reality, it was mostly rebellion against God. You see, guys and gals, it is about God. It has always been about God. It will always be about God. So again, basically, Paul is stating here in verse 3, you know, that so, so what if some were unfaithful? Because notice he goes, well, in verse 3, will their unbelief or their unfaithfulness make the faithfulness of God without effect? Many people, many nations around the world would look upon Israel, and you could read through it again that, you know, oh, your God has abandoned you. Oh, your God is this. And, and a lot of the nations, a lot of the people would look at the unfaithfulness of Israel and place that same unfaithfulness on God. And, and that's what he's saying here. Look, will their unbelief, will their unfaithfulness make the faithfulness of God without effect? You know, the Apostle Paul will address the same issue in greater depth in chapters 9, 10, and 11 here in the book of Romans. And, and we'll get further into this thought. But we need to remember, as I said a moment ago, that the, the, the story of the Bible is his story, history. His story. It is not about anyone but God. He is the main character. We are the co-stars, if you will. You know, it's not about the great saints of old. It's not about the great stories of what people have done. It's not even specifically about the Jewish people. It's not even specifically about the Christian people. It is all about God, His work, His faithfulness, His holiness, His power, His will, His word, His love, His grace, His peace, His divine being and divine plan that has been enacted since the beginning of time it is about God he is the director the writer the producer the main star if you will in today's vernacular it's all about him and I don't know about you but I'm glad that it's all about him I don't know about you but I would not want my life made into a movie although when the book of life is opened up many will see basically that movie not me They're going to open mine up and it's going to say Jesus paid in full to tell us die. And I'm thankful for that. You know, guys and gals, it can be quite humbling and sobering when we realize that something is not all about us. You know, I read a study a few years ago and it was done in many of the colleges, universities, and they basically said that we have the most narcissistic generation that has been recorded. The most generation where it's about me. And, and by the way, you know, if you're like in that generation of, you know, the 15-year-olds or, you know, 14, 15 up to, they say, 30, and don't think I'm just pointing you out. Because it's all of us. We all have the tendency to make everything all about us. Everything all about me. Even once we become Christian, we have that same thought that, well, aren't you lucky, God, that I finally decided to come to you? I've met people like that. I've even had thoughts like that. It's wickedness. It's, it should be more like, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner, as we beat our chest and, and weep out to the Lord. I'm just a sinner. I don't, I don't deserve to enter into heaven. Amen. It's by God's grace through faith that we come to the Lord. You see, guys and gals, even though the Jewish people had been chosen by God himself, they thought it was all about them. They thought it was all about them that, you know, because of who they were is why they were chosen, not because of who God is. 
And you see, we need to be careful of this same thought today, you know, even within Christianity, because a lot of us, we think it's all about us. We think it's all about us, and unless you think I'm talking about someone else beside you and me, how many of us get disappointed when something bad happens in our life? Oh Lord, how could you let this happen? Or when that thing that we prayed for so earnestly, Lord, I even prayed a whole five minutes in sweats of sweat, and I was, oh, just five whole minutes, Lord. And you didn't give me that guy as a fiancé. You didn't give me that gal as a girlfriend. Oh, Lord, you didn't give me that job. And how many of us have looked back five years later, two or three, and say, praise God, you didn't give me that guy, Lord. Praise the Lord, you didn't give me that gal. Thank you, you didn't give me that job. Or maybe he let you go in his imperfect will and you married anyway, and you're like, oh, Lord, help me. (laughs) And he does. Isn't that the beauty of our God? He doesn't just say, well, you made your decision, goodbye. No, he goes, you know what? I'm working all things together to good to those who love me and those who are called according to our purpose. That is who our God is. He is faithful even when we are not. We need to remember this, man. We need to remember who God is. And we too as Christians have been entrusted with the oracles of God. And yet there are many who proclaim the name of Christ who don't live by these oracles. And so will their unfaithfulness make God unfaithful? No. You see, we too can give people cause to blaspheme the name of the Lord. Hey, you know, we need to remember that once we are born again of the Spirit of God, we still have this, these vessels of flesh that are sinful. Uh, it's described continually throughout the Scripture as a battle between the flesh and the Spirit. Our flesh still wants to go and sin. Can I have an amen? And by the way, sometimes we give in to that. But God is ever faithful. But we also need to remember that sometimes we can give people cause to blaspheme the name of the Lord. So we get angry, we get upset as our, you know, temperatures rise or other things. We get tempted into sin. So we too can become those who are unfaithful to the words that God has given us. We need to be careful. You know, I think specifically here about those who have been hurt in the name of Christ. And I'm sure that if we went around the church this morning, we can find many, if not every person here, that has been hurt by some time or another by somebody in church. Now, I need to remind us that there have probably been times that we might not even realize that we ourselves have hurt others in church too. Now, lest you say, oh, well, not me. I'm too holy. I'm too wonderful. I'm too precious, you know, or too whatever. No, you're not. Really, I promise. Neither am I. I'm chief of sinners here. And I remember, I, I've talked to people, and I remember years ago, coming up to some lady that I'd, I'd known years ago. I hadn't seen her for many years. Oh, it's so good to see you. How you doing? How's your walk going? What's, and she's like, she literally like looked shocked at me. And I'm like, what's the matter? And she's like, well, I thought you didn't like me anymore. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Why would you say that? She said, well, last time I came up, you know, to talk to you, you were talking to other people, and you just totally ignored me and I thought you were, you know, didn't like me anymore, didn't want, and I looked at her and I said, you know, and I literally got tears in my eyes. I'm like, I am so sorry I made you feel that way. I must have been distracted. I was probably just being a bonehead, and I, I don't even remember doing that. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And she was shocked. You see, sometimes we can be hurt by people, and they don't even know that they've hurt by us. That's why Jesus said to go to someone if they've sinned against But notice here within verse 3, will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? And and if you can, you can circle that word unbelief in your Bible and write unfaithfulness as well. That word again can mean unfaithfulness. Will their unfaithfulness make the faithfulness of God without effect? Paul answers in verse 4, certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, every man a liar. You can have an amen. I don't try to ask for amens too much anymore. On the radio, 
People have said, hey, you're asking for too many amens. I, I just like to get you involved. So feel free to throw out amens, by the way, whenever you feel like the Lord putting on your heart. But look, man, let God be true, but every man a liar. Hey, even if, you know, certain people think that you look up to, over the years, I, you know, I'm 57, and, and I've sit, sat under the ministry of some wonderful teachers. I've, I, I've been so blessed. I listen on the radios to certain guys, and, and I've been so blessed over the years, and yet some of those guys have fallen away from the Lord. They become, uh, became unfaithful to the Lord. Now, I know some people who fall away with them. Well, if pastor so-and-so, he committed adultery, man, I am gone. This whole Christian thing is a, it's a scam. Well, you know what, guys and gals? Shame on you. Shame on me because we put too much faith in someone else instead of Jesus Christ. Remember what Paul even wrote. He said, look, follow me as I follow Christ. He didn't say, hey, follow me because I'm as perfect as Christ. He's like, no, as I follow Christ, and if I don't, don't follow me in the areas I don't. We know Paul could be a hothead at times. Him and Barnabas split up. And we read later that it seems like they made up. It's John Mark. Hey, will you send John Mark to me, man? You know what, guys and gals, if you've been hurt by people in the ministry, just remember that let every man be made a liar, but God is ever true. God is ever faithful. Hey, I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. Oh, Talia and I have been hurt in the ministry many times. And, and I'll tell you what, you know, besides my brother being shot and killed, and my dad, you know, and other people dying, but the, the, when you're hurt in the church by people you really love and respect, it's just about as bad as that. At least for us it was. So there still might be tears. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's not going to hurt. But you bring that hurt to the one who is ever faithful. You bring that one to the, the one who will never lie. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice what it says here in verse 4. As it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Now he's basically quoting from Psalm 51, 4. And let me read this out of the New Living because it makes it a little more comprehensible to me as the scriptures say about him you will be proved right in what you say and you will win your case in court you see god is right every time god is faithful every single time hey this applies to even if you know for people who have been abused in the church over the years man I, I, it shocks me i grew up in the catholic church i was an altar boy and, and I was, praise God, never abused, never, you know, I, I found out later that I knew somebody, a priest, who was abusing kids. And by God's grace, my brother who was under his ministry or whatever was never abused either. But there's been a lot of people, and they, and they leave the church thinking, you know what, that's just the wickedness, and it is the wickedness. There's been stuff in, within even Calvary chapels and other, you know, uh, non-denominational churches, evangelical churches where the same wickedness happens or other things. We do not put our faith in men and women. Hey, we're to respect and honor those who are in authority over us. But don't look to me like I'm God, please. I will not take that role in your life. People will come to me, Pastor Bill, you know, I need you to tell me what to do. It's like, well, what does God tell you to do? What does the Lord say? And I'll, I'll give an opinion sometimes, but I'll always say, look, this is an opinion. I'm a human being. This is, you know, based on Scripture. You know, should you do this? No, the Bible says don't do that. Or, but if it's something, you know, where it's like, hey, should I do this, this job or that? I'll be praying with you. And let me give you some advice that I have. And you take that as your pastor. You take even as I'm teaching and preaching now. But you never look to me to have your relationship with God for you. I'm not here for that. And, you know, there's a lot of pastors that like that authority in your life. That's not me. That doesn't mean I want to be distant. That doesn't mean whatever. But I'm simply a man who is up here stirring you all up, edifying you for the work of the ministry. You see, I'm not even supposed to do all the work of the ministry. That's all of your job, too. It's all of our jobs. Part of my job as a pastor is to stand up here to teach and to preach, to, to build you up, to feed you the Word of God. 
But Jesus Christ is ever faithful. I'll tell you what, that's one of the reasons that I love reading the old dead guys. Some of the old dead gals. I, I'm seriously, I can't wait to meet Matthew Henry. I can't wait to meet uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones and others. Guys and gals who finished faithfully. Elizabeth Elliot. Man, just I, I just, I can't wait. Because, you know, and again, you, you put yourself under a live mentors today, and that's okay, please don't get me wrong. But just again, remember to hold everything that everybody tells you up to the word of God. Is it true? But God is the one who is ever faithful. Now, there are many within the church who say today that God has replaced the Jewish nation with the church. But as we read here this morning, this, Paul is teaching against it even here. You know, basically, when we ask people why they believe this, why do you believe that God has replaced the Jewish nation with the church? And the, the answer that I always hear is because Israel was unfaithful to God. Israel was unfaithful time and time and time again to God. And they basically have not read or simply ignore the scriptures that are even in front of us here this morning. Paul asked the reader of this letter here in verse 3, will the unfaithfulness of the Jewish people make the faithfulness of God without effect? And he replies, certainly not. You see, these Christians, though, would say yes. That as a matter of fact, because the Jewish people were continually unfaithful to God, then God forsook all his promises to them. They've misconstrued the words of God and ignored others. That God is ever faithful. And that the unfaithfulness of the Jewish people does not mean God is now going to be unfaithful. Hey, we read throughout the Old Testament that he will hand them over to the Gentiles, basically, to the other nations for a time of chastisement. But that he will bring them back to their land. And after he's done bringing them back to their land, and by the way, this officially started May 14th, 1948, it started before that with the Belfort and, and other different things. But the, the official date, can a nation, the Bible says, be born in a day? It was. And by the way, God is still bringing back his people. And then it goes on to say in many different scriptures, then, after I brought them back to the land, then I will give them a new heart, a new spirit. They will be my people. I will be their God. Because God is ever faithful, even though even today most of the Jewish people are not. God's promises, God's faithfulness, God's word will stand forever. Let every man, let every woman be a liar, but let God be true. You know, it's very dangerous to believe or to think that God will forsake those who forsake him. How many of us have forsaken the Lord in our lifetime, especially before Christ? It's dangerous because it then nullifies the word of God. And in reality, though, it doesn't nullify the word of God. You see, that's the trick. In our minds and in our hearts it does, in a way. Like, well, to me, it's, I'm done with the Lord. And, and in reality, it's like, it doesn't matter if you're done with me because I'm still here. It's like, well, I don't believe in the law of gravity anymore. I just don't believe in it. Been made up over the years. All right, we'll go up to the roof. Let's jump off. We'll all go out. We'll let's video for, you know, Facebook. And we'll try to catch you because we love you. But our unbelief does not nullify the law of gravity, does it? Anybody? The, the unbelief of the whole world it doesn't nullify that God is real, that there is a heaven and there is a hell. That if we reject God, we are going to hell for all eternity, which will one day be thrown into the lake of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth forever and ever. Again, don't believe me. This is what God says. Well, I don't believe what God says. What well, does it matter? Again, think of the law of gravity. Think of the law of thermal, the thermodynamics. All these, it doesn't matter if we believe them. They're true. 
You see, guys and gals, the words of God stand forever, whether we believe them or not. But here's the key. When we believe them and we live in accordance to them, God does things, radical things in our lives. He deepens us. He builds us up. He uses us for his glory. He helps us to be a light out in this world that is so dark. You know, guys and gals, even when, you know, Christians or professing Christians are unfaithful, God is ever true. Hey, maybe you've been unfaithful even today. Or, hey, I've been living in sin and people don't even know the things I've been doing. God knows and he is calling you to repentance this day because he is faithful. Confess your sins and he will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Today is the day. Don't live that way anymore. If you're a compromised Christian, if you're a fake Christian, you, you know that there's something dead in you, that you know there's nothing alive, then come to Christ. If you're a Christian that is just so consumed by the world, you're asleep, you're just kind of, oh, you know, I used to be on fire for Jesus long ago. Come back to the first works. Come back to your first love. Because God is ever faithful as we read these scriptures this morning and we understand the faithfulness of god i don't know about you but for me even doing this study it helps remind me you know what lord every word is faithful every word is true not one jot not one tittle not one comma not one dot will pass away, Jesus said. He holds his word above his name, God tells us. He is ever faithful, and his word is ever true. May we not be like the Jews. Again, that's why part of this is in here. This, you know, this is addressing the Jewish people, but it's also here for us as Christians to learn from. That's when we go back to the Old Testament, we can read, oh, look at, man, you know, that's what a lot of people read. Oh, look at these scumbag Jews. Boy, I sure am glad I'm not like them. And it's led to hatred for the last 2,000 years from guys like Martin Luther and others who had this ungodly and unbiblical hatred for the Jewish people. Well, hey, let's wake ourselves up. You know what? Those are just pictures of us. That would be you and me in the Old Testament. Those are just us. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Only God and God alone is faithful. In Deuteronomy 32, 4, we read that he is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice. A God of truth and without injustice. Righteousness and upright is he. Psalm 105, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures for all generations. Psalm 119, 160, the entirety of your word is truth and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. And lastly, Titus 1, 1 through 3, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life with God who cannot lie as promised from the beginning. God cannot lie. God is ever faithful. May we put our trust in the faithfulness of God and in no one else. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, even as we read your word this morning and study, Father, may it find just places of, of good soil within our hearts, Lord. May we remember your faithfulness, Lord. Man, especially in the days that we're living, Lord. Father, may you bless those watching. May you bless those here with a, a fresh anointing of your Holy Spirit, Lord, wherever we're at, Lord God. We pray for those who are authority over us, Lord, that we might live peaceably. And we pray against the darkness that continues to assault this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.